All right, it says we're live. Oh my gosh. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Grad Chat from PhD Balance, where we talk about topics of grad school beyond academic research and that may be more difficult to talk about in our day to day. I'm your host, Faye Lin, and I'm a PhD candidate in biochemistry at UCLA. If you like what you see here, check out the PhD right, Balance YouTube channel. We're live for oh more gosh. grad chats and don't forget to subscribe for notica- notifications about when we go live. <laughs> Our topic today is speaking out in academia and I am so excited to talk to our guest Jacqueline Siegel. Jacqueline is a PhD candidate at Western University where she holds a doctoral fellowship in the network for economic and social trends. Her research spans a variety of topics related to gender, sexuality, stigma, social justice, and mental health. So welcome, Jacqueline. How are you doing today? Hi, I am doing really well. Frankly, I'm a little bit nervous, but I think nerves are a little bit good sometimes. Hopefully, uh, they work in a positive direction. Oh, yeah, for sure. I am so excited to have a conversation with you, and I'm sure our audience is as well, because I am a huge fan on Twitter, and you are just such a big influencer on Twitter, And you talk a lot about speaking out in academia, which is our topic today. So if you just want to say a few words about why are you interested in talking about speaking out in academia? Yeah, so we talked about this a little bit right before we went live. And I'm not sure that I have um, a well put together answer for you. However, it's a question that I get quite a lot from other graduate students, you know, how is it that you feel so comfortable speaking out about this kind of stuff? You know, I wish that I could talk about social justice issues online. I wish that I could address some of the things that I'm seeing in the academy, but I don't feel comfortable doing it. And um, it is something that I clearly do feel comfortable doing. And I was grateful to have the opportunity to chat with you about it. Woo. Yeah. Uh, And I know it's a topic that I also personally feel like is super important and I think also draw attention to because in academia there's just so many broken things (laughs) that we need to speak out about and that it's not always to speak out about. So we had people submit questions from social media and I think one common question was how do you deal with anxiety around standing up and speaking out? Does it get easier with time? Yes. Um, So I, I am often, so I get a lot of questions from people both through like DMs and emails. People are kind of always contacting me about academic stuff and it's great and it's lovely. I love speaking to people about it. But one of the questions that I often get is, how are you so confident? It feels like, you know, you're, you don't seem anxious about anything. And I often laugh because I have an anxiety disorder. Like I am a super nervous person about just about everything. And I think that what people see on social media is like very clearly only half the story. So when I first started um, talking about social justice issues in the academy, I was terrified. I mean, so I did two years of a master's that was concurrent with my undergraduate degree. And I was like super passive, super quiet, super silent. Um, I, however, got involved in doing qualitative research as a master's student. And I recognized very quickly that people were going to um, speak down to me, perhaps because I'm a woman, perhaps because I am like, uh, I don't look like a typical academic. I don't, you know, I don't elude seriousness and, and I'm sorry, I don't exude seriousness and, and professionalism all the time. Uh, but I also think that because I was studying stigmatized topics and doing it in a way that kind of goes against the grain in academia, I was receiving some pushback from the very beginning and I didn't know what to do about that. Um, I just remember it being very upsetting that people would say things to me that I felt were inappropriate. And this came from professors, this came from other students, this came from like really just like people in my life that I didn't feel comfortable speaking up to at the time. And then I started my PhD and it became apparent very early on that I was going to be studying feminism. And I claimed the label of feminist for myself. I was like, well, clearly I am a feminist. And then I found myself in situations where I was using this label of feminist, but I was not treating myself um, or others around me in a way that I felt a feminist should. Because if you want to like walk the walk, I'm sorry, if you want to talk the talk, you kind of have to walk the walk with feminism. You can't just say, yes, I'm a feminist. And like, yes, here's all this sexist stuff that's happening around me, but oh, well, I don't want to get involved because it's uncomfortable. So uh, 
yeah, it started out pretty early uh, in my PhD career that I started to make to take small risks. And a lot of the reason why it became comfortable for me was because I have always had fabulous support systems of other women who have not just kind of encouraged me to speak out, but have provided me with opportunities to do so. And like, I mean, I could rattle off a list that would probably take the rest of this hour to tell you about all of the fabulous women who have nurtured me through my academic career and encouraged me to really use my voice uh, and have told me that my voice is a powerful thing. And that has certainly made it easier. I think that was my first step in the door. And then finally, I think once I started to do it a bit more, people sort of kind of started to expect it from me. And so it wasn't so weird um, when I would start speaking out and I would ha then have people who would want to be engaged in those conversations with me. Um, it just became a kind of beneficial experience. And then sometimes it just got to the point where I would see things happening around me and I'll tell um, an anecdote after this, but like there were some times when I witnessed such obvious and blatant sexism that I felt like I, I simply couldn't uh, keep my mouth shut about it. Um, and I, <laughs> I mean, in many ways, it's a, it's a, a good thing because I do in, in like small ways, I do think that these interactions and exchanges are changing circumstances like a little tiny bit in the right direction, but it's also um, been challenging uh, as, as a person. And, and I found myself in situations that uh, I, perhaps was less comfortable in than I would have liked to be. But so the example that I wanted to give was like, I was at a conference once and I was in, uh, I, it was not my particular presentation at the time, but um, a scholar was describing an experiment in which he brought women into the lab and he sexually objectified them by gazing at their breasts. And then he, uh, um, he I don't know, he gave some sort of test afterwards. So like, I think it was probably to induce state self-objectification. And so women responded to a bunch of questionnaires afterwards. And like, I, I just remember, I was probably in the second year of my PhD at the time, but I just raised my hand and I was like, in what universe is it ethical to sexually objectify, sexually harass women in the lab? I just feel like this is a study that should not have been done. And there were a few people in the audience that were like, like, you know, seasoned people in the audience who were like, you know, probably shouldn't have done that. But I do just feel like if nobody says anything, then these systems and these kind of experiences that women continue to have in the academy are just going to keep going. So if I have to be the squeaky wheel, then like, so be it. And I, I think I've just kind of kept on being the squeaky wheel <laughs> for the duration of my PhD. So yeah, I think all of that is just so so inspiring and you you talked about so many layers to this topic where one sometimes like you said it's just so blatantly horrible <laughs> that it's just really hard not to speak out about it especially when it's personal stories like personal stories that have impacted you and that that are important to get out there if it's to let people know who haven't had these experiences what that's like and to raise awareness you know you talk about support networks are important and then also how as you speak out you gain this if it's confidence or just just more more power in in speaking out and how you gain momentum and how it can become so so positive so I, I mean I think that that shows a lot in your Twitter presence how much you just are this really courageous fearless person really making such a positive impact at least what I see online I'm so excited to talk to you I'm so excited <laughs> I just want to address that like I am not fearless uh I'm frankly not all that courageous either I um I being having such a public presence really does make me rather nervous a lot of the time. Uh, it's very anxiety producing for me. Uh, and I don't think that people see the other side of it where I do kind of feel like a lot of the things that I say and do are scrutinized and uh, just it's, it's a challenge. Uh, it's, it's not all sunshine and roses and it's not, um, it's just, it, it's not something that comes naturally or comes easily to me. And I, I just want to make that clear that like, it's still hard, even if you don't necessarily see it. I think that's also such a great point to bring up that behind all of these public spaces that we both kind of, you know, on Twitter build these platforms 
And I, I'm so glad you brought that up as well, because I think a lot of people, when they're asking about how do I get into advocacy, they do feel some sort of nerves or anxiousness and, and feel that because of those nerves, you're kind of like, I don't know, uh, restricted in how much you can do. But I think that's such a great point to validate that this is hard. This is hard stuff to talk about and that you don't have to be c completely fearless and courageous or anything, but that it's very human to also be vulnerable. And these are difficult topics to talk about. And I think with that, people submitted questions on social media and a common question we get in a lot of these grad chats is how do you deal with imposter syndrome, I think is a related topic to this. Oh, you have frozen on my screen. Um, oh no. Oh no, you're moving? back. Hello. <laughs> 2020. <laughs> Great year. <laughs> Woo. Well, uh, the question that I had just posed was, how do you deal with imposter syndrome if I'm unfrozen now? Yes, you are. Okay. <laughs> I have so many thoughts and feelings about imposter syndrome, and this came up in the Instagram live yesterday. Um, first of all, you know, there will there are some people who are like, I don't have imposter syndrome, and frankly, I don't believe them. Because every time I've spoken to someone who is like a big name in the field, and I don't mean that in like a, I speak with big people who are big names in the field kind of way, but like just through my networks, like there are people who I think there is no way on earth that this person could ever have imposter syndrome. This person is the editor in chief of a journal. This person has like 275 publications. Like there are just people who should not have imposter syndrome and yet they still do. Um, and I think learning that was a comfort for me. But I also think that, and like, a, I'm not gonna apologize for this, but I will warn you that um, I do think that a lot of this is structural because when we talk about the neoliberal academy and we talk about this constant pressure to produce, keeping academics in a state of precarity where they feel that they cannot and do not deserve to be here, that forces us to produce more and it forces us to drive ourselves into the ground. So I think part of imposter syndrome, like this is something that like the, the higher powers are forcing us to all experience. And I think recognizing that, recognizing that this is structural helps because then you recognize it as like almost like a system of oppression that we are all kind of facing and that we're all kind of experiencing together. So that is my like feminist perspective on it. However, personally, um, I of course feel imposter syndrome all the time. Um, I think especially having a platform where I can speak with a lot of different academics gives me even more imposter syndrome. But something that I have found helpful is recognizing my limitations and learning my strengths and then playing to my strengths. So I am not a statistician. I, stats makes me really nervous. Uh, every time I have to analyze my data that's quantitative, I'm like, okay, I need to crack open all the textbooks. I'm gonna need all the references. I don't know how to do any of this code. That is something that makes me nervous. However, I know what my strengths are. I know that I am a strong writer. I know that I am a strong qualitative researcher. I know that I'm great with uh, qualitative data analysis. I know that um, I'm great with deadlines. I know that I feel comfortable speaking in public. Like I have strengths that I play to. And when I have opportunities to kind of hone the other skills, then I'll work on those. But remembering that like the demands of academia and the demands of having an academic job and an academic career are unrealistic for all sorts of people. And it's frankly, it would be impossible to be an expert and to have like, to feel comfortable doing all of the different things that we as academics are supposed to do. So my advice is lean into your strengths and, you know, try to work on the other stuff when you can. Love it, love it. I, I just wanna say, so Susanna's in the chat here, Susanna Harris, and she just was hey. like, you know, part of imposter, quote what you said, part of imposter syndrome, this is something the higher powers are forcing us to experience. And, oh, and she says, yes. <laughs> so I just, I just think that's such an important point when we talk about imposter syndrome, especially in the academy, because it's a big, it's an important distinction that, you know, there's imposter syndrome when you think or you feel like you're the one who doesn't belong here. But then it's a whole nother thing when it's the system and people around you telling you that you don't belong here. And like you said, Jacqueline, it, it hints at this 
more systemic issue that it's beyond imposter syndrome of, of us thinking we don't belong here, but also the environment and how it's unhealthy and how it's not, not supportive. And I, whenever we talk about imposter syndrome on these grad chats, I think that's a super important distinction that also is helpful if you are going through these feelings of I don't belong here, that sometimes it's just the system not supporting you and that it's not about you. <laughs> Yeah, some of the themes. Absolutely. absolutely. And also recognizing that I think that we all, especially now that we're seeing more and more academics on social media, we only, and I know this is like a common refrain, and I know that everybody kind of conceptually knows this, but we're only seeing people's highlight reels. And like, I love looking at people's shadow CVs where they talk about all the stuff that they have not gotten. I keep one of my own and it's like four or five times the length of my actual CV. Um, but knowing that Everyone is failing in, in small ways every day. Everyone is making mistakes. You just don't see it because, and again, this kind of goes back to these structural issues in academia where we are expected to be flawless and perfect all of the time. We're not allowed to make mistakes. And that is a lie. <laughs> Frankly, we are all failing all of the time. And I think it's it's helpful to keep that in mind. So like, I have a, a big old Slack, Slack group of graduate students where we have like, we have our, our good news yay channels, but we also have like our rejection channels and we all talk about mental health stuff and we talk about our failures um, with papers and with conference presentations. And it's a space where we all are able to see all of the different facets of what it's like to be a PhD candidate or to be a PhD student or a master's student or to be like a young working professional. We just get to see the whole depth of it. And I don't think that that's something that we see both within the department, but also a lot of the times you don't see it, see it on social media. And so it's important to recognize that we're all failing. Nobody knows what they're doing. We're all just working it out. <laughs> Boo. Yeah, exactly. I think we, it's something we need to talk about more, how much of how much failure there is in, in going through a journey and how that's normal and that, how that helps us you know, discover ourselves, develop new skills, so much of I guess the outside or, or like what you project on the outside is this accomplishment. And I, I love these grad chats because I think this really is a space to kind of normalize those discussions and to tell everyone that like, you know, sometimes the journey can be hard. Sometimes there's failure, but it's all normal and you are doing great. You belong here. And there are also certain systemic issues to call out and address that need to be fixed because they are the ones that are putting you down. So amazing. Um, if So we have, okay, I want to get to some of these other questions in the chat here. And again, our topic today, speaking out in academia, and one of these questions here says, have you ever had to deal with academics being passive aggressive about you standing up for yourself or others? Um, maybe not passive aggressive, but aggressive. Yes. <laughs> I mean, we know, I study feminist stigma. I know the stereotypes that are attributed to people who identify as feminists, both women and men. There's not any research on non-binary individuals who identify as feminists, but if you're doing that work, please let me know because I would love to cite you. Um, I have definitely, I've been called every name in the book <laughs> um, because of the way that I choose to conduct myself. Um, I mean, in many ways, speaking out puts a target on your back. And I have absolutely, I mean, I, I'm fine. I, I have a fairly strong backbone and I can kind of take it, but like I've been targeted by like, you know, trolls on Twitter and, and trolls on 4chan. And, you know, I don't, I mean, I don't want to like name names, but even within my university, there have been people who have uh, certainly made it known that they don't appreciate the way that I, uh, stand up for myself and stand up for other women. Um, I have certainly been called too feminist, a feminist bitch, mouthy feminist, all those sorts of things uh, that people think are insults, but frankly are kind of the whole point of me speaking out. So uh, yeah, I've certainly dealt with some backlash and some uh, passive or just regular aggression, but and, and I talked about this on the live stream yesterday or the Instagram takeover those people are not my people. And um, there are spaces where my voice is valued and there are organizations that uh, really 
care about the things that I have to say. And those are the organizations and those are the people that I choose to spend my time with. And frankly, if people don't like that someone is, uh, that someone has the audacity <laughs> to stand up for themselves or to stand up for other people, then like, that's probably not a person that I really want to be spending too much time with. So, and frankly, if those are the people who are on hiring committees, then I think this comes up quite a lot too, where people are like, you're so outspoken. Aren't you afraid that you're not going to get a job? And first of all, yes, <laughs> I'm very afraid that I'm not going to get a job, but also like, if I, I could not possibly flourish, I could not possibly thrive, I could not possibly be happy in a place where people want me to keep my mouth shut. That's just not gonna work. So if that means that I have to like step out of academia, so be it, because there are certainly going to be places and people who will care about the things that I have to say and will think that what I have to say is valuable. I think that's so important. And I just wanna echo, echo so many things of what you just said. So there's this aspect of, if my voice isn't valued here, then this isn't a space I want to be in. I think that's information for you to know about if this is going to be a supportive environment that if, for example, for me, I talk so much about mental health, depression and all that. And I, I face similar situations if it's backlash or nervousness, if this is going to impact professional development. And in the beginning, it was something that felt like was silencing me or restricting me and how much I say but over time I, I think and also after a lot of therapy too <laughs> working this out in therapy, I, therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that is such an important message that I, I want our audience to really drill in is that if you're interested in advocacy and want to speak out about things that might risk backlash or professional development, et cetera, I think it is information for you that if there, if the space doesn't value this stuff, then this isn't a space that is going to be supportive. And that's information for, for you to know. Um, these conversations are great for pushing positive change, but you know, there, it's also important to be strategic as, as well, you know, as we push forward, how to face the backlash, how to keep in mind, how to take care of ourselves. These are all such important themes that you brought up here, Jacqueline. Amazing. Um, so let's see, one of the questions, we have a question here in the chat that says, could diversity policies promote imposter syndrome in underrepresented disadvantaged groups? Uh, it could be easy to quote, allow the access, um, but it does end there. I, I guess, like, I don't know if Daniela, who asked this, wants to clarify a bit, but I guess the question's related to diversity policies and if they are really effective in uh, supporting underrepresented disadvantaged groups and how, how could we improve those policies? I don't know, if Jacqueline, you... Um, so I am not... A diversity expert, but I'm happy to uh, take a swing at this if you will, if you'll let me. Uh, so, I mean, there are a number of diversity policies, right? Like, it's not one blanket statement. I think that it's important to remember that, like, getting people in the door is is one important job as far as uh, making EDI work. But then we need to support people when they're in there. So it's great that we have like affirmative action initiatives to. Um, those are amazing. They're absolutely vital um, to, to recruit underrepresented groups and, and more women. But like, we need to make sure that there is the scaffolding and structural support to ensure that people, when they get in there, are able to thrive and flourish and be comfortable. Because frankly, if we're bringing people into a space where they're going to experience stigma and discrimination, then it's possible that we're doing more harm than good. So diversity initiatives, fabulous. We need to do more. And I think that is my response for you. Right, right. Exactly. So, uh, oh, I guess so. Daniela uh, clarified that. Uh, so she was asking. It says it could be easy to first allow the access, but it does not end there. <laughs> yes, and I think that's kind of what I'm saying. Where, like, it's a first step, but we need comprehensive EDI initiatives in order to support people long term because. We're, like I said, like bringing people into a space where they're going to feel marginalized and minoritized, like that's not good. We need to create spaces where people can flourish. Uh, we need to get people there first. And then we need to make sure that the structural support is there in order to ensure that they are able to work to um, their highest capacity. 
Yeah, exactly. And I think so many of these initiatives focus on the application process and how to get a diverse pool of applicants. But oftentimes, like you were saying, like it, once we have people in, in the program institution, et cetera, there has to be more work done after that. And oftentimes I think it is so focused on the application process itself. So that, that's such an important point. Let's see. All right. We have more questions submitted on social media here. So Jacqueline, in your intro post that we had posted for you on our PhD Balance website, you talked about dealing with, quote, unlearning how to be a good woman, end quote. Do you want to talk a little bit more about what that means and how did you deal with unlearning how to be a good woman? Yeah, so that's like a big phrase and it's a little bit kind of flowery language, uh, but unlearning like womanly socialization is something that I am actively committed to. Um, I mean, I've certainly, like I have explored all of the dimensions of femininity and some of them I feel are appropriate for me and some of them I feel are completely not. And so this is a journey that kind of started for me um, when I when I was young. I was always super, super feminine. And, you know, as a child, what that means is like, you know, I like to wear dresses and I like to, you know, get dressed up and wear makeup and things like that. Um, and then that quickly transformed uh, into a desire to make myself into a, like essentially an ornament for other people. I did not feel as though my voice was valuable. I felt like my appearance was really the most important thing about me. I wanted to make myself small and neat <laughs> and not really difficult in any way. And one of the ways that that manifested was through a, um, a clinically significant eating disorder that took like took many years. It took many relationships away from me. Um, my eating disorder was like very close to ending my life. Uh, and you know, we, we can get into some of the specifics of that a bit later, but when I went into eating disorder treatment, I went into like a feminist eating disorder treatment. And one of the first things that a therapist said to me was, when was the last time that you felt angry? And I was like, I don't feel anger. <laughs> I don't get mad about anything. Um, that that's not an emotion that I feel. That's not really ladylike. Uh, and she was like, "Well, like, what do you mean it's not ladylike? You have a lot to be angry about." And I think that was one of the first. <laughs> sorry, there's a motorcycle outside. Um, but that was one of the first moments where I was like, "Huh, it's okay if I break the rules here." Um, and then I just kind of kept breaking rules. And so there are so many things and so many ways that women are denied, systematically denied access to our pleasures and to our desires and to our hungers. And some of that is through food. Women are supposed to be thin, right? Some of that is through sexuality. Women are you know, supposed to be prudent and not supposed to have any sort of um, sexual desires or sexual cravings. Some of it is through ambition. Women are not supposed to be too much. No, they're not supposed to want too much. And um, I think through a lot of therapy, so much therapy. I have been in therapy for so long. Uh, my poor therapist. Same. Speaking Same. for the yes. great. Everybody should get some form of therapy. Everyone needs it. You think you don't need it, but you need it. But anyway, through therapy, um, I really just learned to love that hunger. So it's it's hunger for life. It's hunger for people and for intimacy and for for just everything. I, I love being able to kind of say, yes, I know that women are supposed to do this, but I think that's ridiculous and I'm not going to do it. And a lot of that is being quiet. And a lot of that is not speaking up when, when things are hard. And so that is something that I am actively trying to do in academia is to, you know, be a loud mouth, <laughs> but it also happens within the context of my own life. So like even people that I love and people that I'm close to, um, if, if things come up that make me uncomfortable, like I'll absolutely address it right away. If it's something that is subtly sexist, I will absolutely point it out, even if it kind of makes that person uncomfortable. And I think that's kind of what I mean by unlearning how to be a good woman. I think nobody would look at me and be like, wow, like that is the image of femininity. <laughs> so domestic, <laughs> so, like it's just, that's, that's not me. And exploring 
dimensions of masculinity and exploring dimensions of femininity in a way that's non-judgmental and non-stigmatizing has been a really kind of therapeutic and cathartic process for me to kind of figure out what is it that is, um, what is it that feels good and what is it that, I hate to use the word empowers, but what is it that makes me feel as though I am moving in a direction that is in accordance with my values and makes me feel good and unlearning some of what it means to be the like a perfect woman is, is a, a big part of that. Right. Yeah. No, thanks so much for sharing all of that about your, your personal journey. And I think, especially when it comes to talking about something as personal as like going through an eating disorder recovery, I think can be very personal and they're trimming trees in my backyard. If people were in the chat, were like, why are, why is a guy in a bush just dr- walking by? So you have trimming trees, people, <laughs> live. Uh, anyway, back to our important grad chat. Um, one of the questions we have submitted on social media says, they're curious about how do you manage eating disorder recovery with the stress of a PhD? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, I actually think it's a fantastic question and it's something that I, a lot of people struggle with. So um, I started graduate school before I went into eating disorder treatment. I started grad school in September of 2015, and I went into eating disorder treatment uh, in May of 2016. So I ended up taking a little bit of time off of my master's when I was in treatment because it would have been impossible to do them concurrently. And um, I do absolutely think that, I mean, maybe I can't say with complete certainty, but I want to say with some degree of certainty that the stress of being in a hyper-competitive master's program absolutely exacerbated the symptoms that I was experiencing when it came to my eating disorder. So when I, so I went into treatment, I did like a little stint at the rent Free Center. Shout out to the rent Free Center. Anybody who's looking for an eating disorder treatment center, rent Free is absolutely amazing. Um, really compassionate care. I really uh, encourage everyone to explore that option if that's something that you're looking for. But so I went back to my master's program in September and I relapsed so hard. Um, Frankly, I think I was in a worse place after I got out of treatment than before I was in treatment because I was back in in a situation in the same kind of setting that triggered all of my eating disorder cognitions and behaviors, but I was also like convinced that I was healed and recovered so it was fine and I could do the same thing. And that's not how eating disorder recovery works at all. And so I entered into this relapse and realistically um, that relapse continued for a really long time. I was really sick still the first two years of my PhD. Uh, I was very unwell. I uh, continued to allow the disease to control my behaviors and my attitudes and the ways that I was engaging with the world. And then um, I went to a conference, I, I study eating disorders. So I was at the International Conference on Eating Disorders and we all went out to dinner one night and I was like struggling. <laughs> it was embarrassing because it, I was unable to connect with other people. I was unable to network in that moment. Um, it was just a really, really horrible night. And then the following day, my supervisor actually, and like, I, I have a very close relationship with my supervisor. It's inappropriately close. Not in, in like legitimately inappropriate, but we are, we just like have a great relationship that's very personal. And so she sat me down and she was like, hey girl, you can't eat again. And I was like, I know it's horrible. And so it was after that, that I did start seeing a therapist for my eating disorder and I started seeing a dietitian for my eating disorder again. And now I find myself really in a position where I feel like so many things in my life are going right. Um, personally, professionally, I'm so happy right now. I cannot imagine putting myself back in a situation where my health and my happiness were in jeopardy again. Um, I also think that this is another thing where it's like speaking out, where it's like, it just kind of gets easier over time. Um, the cognitions that are associated with my eating disorder, like, of course, they still pop up every now and again, but behaviorally, I've gotten used to kind of the mechanics of recovery. Um, So I think that's one part of it. Another part of it, I mean, there's two other parts of it, I guess. The second part of it is I am now involved in communities um, where we address weight stigma. Uh, And weight stigma as a, again, like, I I feel like I just keep kind of repeating myself, but it's a structural issue that we are all kind of facing and we are all dealing with. 
the cultural imperative for people and women in particular to maintain a slender body, that is a form of oppression. And that is certainly a way that um, we are denied access to so many things. Um, it is a way that prejudice is perpetuated throughout the world. And it's something that we need to be vocal about and we need to actively um, kind of work to combat. And so finding myself in fat positive, body positive, um, and really accepting spaces like that has been really helpful. And then the third part of it, and this is the last part I promise, but like, and this was something that came up in therapy when I was still very sick. And it was actually one of the first things that got me into see a nutritionist for the first time. But like, I had a therapist ask me, what are your core values? And I was like, oh, that's obvious. It's super easy. Of course, I've played this game before. But the first one I said was, I want to be a role model for other women. It's very important to me that young women can look up to me and see someone that they want to be like. And she, this woman, God bless her, she didn't get paid enough, but she said to my face, she was like, what do you think young women see when they see you? And I was like, oh no. So now I find myself in a position where, you know, whether it's my students, whether it's, you know, my little cousins, whether it's just children that I see, whether it's whoever sees me as a human being, I want them to be able to look at me and see like, okay, well, like that's a healthy person. And clearly you don't need to like be emaciated in order to be someone who's happy and who is, you know, relatively successful. So serving as a role model and a healthy role model for what recovery looks like and what success and happiness can look like is a, is something that I really, truly deeply value and cherish. And it's something that allows me to really live a life that is in accordance with my values. And that's important to me. Jacqueline, you're amazing. <laughs> you are, you are awesome. I, I think it's, it's awesome how you share your personal story and how you describe that it wasn't, you know, there, there was struggle in there. It wasn't an easy process, but also that it was a journey that because of certain difficult experiences. Now I am really happy to hear you say, you know, you're, I think what you said, you're feel really happy with where you are now or, or really successful with where you are now. And I, I think like that is, that's awesome. I love these discussions. <laughs> you're doing amazing. <laughs> oh my God, thanks. I'm trying really hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, exactly. I think I, I just, again, I love you on Twitter. I think you are so vulnerable and authentic and so inspirational for a lot of people who might be going through similar things and just hearing how the journey can be difficult but how it can get better is such an important message like overarching message for everyone to hear and we are running out of time for this grad chat but Jacqueline if there's anything else in addition that you want to share with us today that we haven't talked about any any remarks um I, oh, wow. Yikes. Um, there, oh, there's so much that I could say. Um, I think that my advice, I guess my, my parting words of wisdom are like, find your people and love them hard. Um, it's very important that all people are supportive and compassionate towards other people in the academy, because this is a profession where people will tear you down, rip you apart, not think twice about it. So if you can be a part of a community that bolsters you and that supports one another like find that and if you are in a program if you are surrounded by people that silence your voice and that make you feel like the things that you have to say don't matter find other people because they're out there and they will support you um you know get linked into great networks and recognize that like the things that you have to say are important. And I think I mean just tying a lot of some of these things together a lot of imposter syndrome comes from us believing that our voices aren't powerful and other people telling us that our voices aren't powerful. But frankly, there will be people who will absolutely cherish the things that you have to say. Um, and they're out there. And I promise if you look hard enough, you will find them. I think those are my, my parting words. Yeah, no, I love it. I think it's a message that it also took me some time to drill in for myself that you know, after a lot of experiences of like people not listening or not valuing you or, or just being blatant, horrible people, <laughs> it is really difficult to, if it's keep fighting or just 
just keep going sometimes. And I think what I've learned as well, especially when it comes to places like Twitter, is that there are so many amazing people who champion this stuff, right? And like, I, I don't think I would have connected with Jacqueline here if it wasn't for a place like yeah. like Twitter. But for for the longest time, I I just relate so much to this because I think you can get stuck in this mindset that there aren't people out there. But in reality, the world is huge. There are so many amazing, supportive people. And it it's frustrating. It takes resilience to find them. But just overarching message that there are people out there. And support networks are are important. Take time to build but and take resilience to, to build. But they are out there. So I love those parting words. It was great. It was great. <laughs> with me i love everything that you are and everything that you do you're a fantastic human being and the world is better because of you oh my god i just want to I, I can't even say anything better i'm just gonna say ditto to you too <laughs> i i love i love i love grad chat Woo! but all right so we are near the end of our grad chat but jacqueline it was absolutely amazing to talk to you today and to hear your story and just hear how inspiring your journey has been and if you're listening now and if this is the first time or if you're a returning listener this has been grad chat from phd balance we go live every saturday 12 p.m pacific 3 p.m eastern if you liked what you see here there are still people trimming trees yes live uh if you did like what you see here feel free to please subscribe to our PhD Balance YouTube channel to get notifications about when we go live. And again, this has been Grad Chat with Jacqueline Siegel, who is absolutely amazing. So I guess it will be, we'll see you all next time. (laughs) Bye. (laughs) Bye all. I have no idea.